consumer of our research. Um, and uh, we have Tom Rebeck. He's uh, based in the UK. Uh, he's leading our enterprise and IoT. We're here very often, so we decided to introduce a couple of things today to, to you and see if, you know, see if we can show you a bit of the research findings. Uh, there are two things we're going to do. One, the first one is I want to show you our framework and the four different approaches that we see in telcos they are taking for IoT, okay? whether it's connectivity to end-to-end -to -end applications. And we're going to show you a few case studies. Uh, then Sherry is going to speak about the IoT opportunities specifically to Malaysia. We do a lot of work here. We, we understand well uh, the, the carriers, what they are doing, as well as globally. There are many global big telcos, uh, more advanced than those here in, in, in Malaysia or in other markets or similar markets. Yeah? So those are, we're going to take them as a reference point, but uh, we also understand the local specifics here. We have our data. We're going to give you a few of our forecasts in revenue, in connectivity, in LPWA. We hear questions from clients uh, in the connectivity side, all these new networks. What's, what's going to happen, right? So Tom is going to touch on that. Um, and, um, and finally, at the end of the session, if there is time, we'll show you one scorecard we did. Uh, we basically surveyed 15 carriers, 15 telcos, in emerging Asian Pacific, including Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and we try to understand, uh, you know, basically everything they're doing in IoT, what is their score in a strategy and execution for IoT. And we're going to show you a magic quadrant of the carriers in this region. Um, so, Tom is going to get started uh, with the operator roles in IoT. I think we want to understand from you as well what are your questions. So, we touch on those. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so why don't you... Uh, okay, thank you. I like to say, uh, Tom Rebeck, I said, Tom Rebeck, Research Director at Analysis Mason. Before I get started, I think, as Alex was saying, it'd be interesting to understand if there are particular questions that you would like us to discuss or things that you'd like us to touch on in the next 45 minutes or so. So are there any, any, any questions at this point uh, in particular you'd like us to talk about? Maybe low power networks is quite a hot topic. Is there anything specific on trends in Malaysia? But that's definitely where we're going to cover that. Business does still be of IoT. So, so, do you refer to the opportunity in, in revenues uh, in IoT and how much is that going to grow? Yeah. Okay. We're going to whether it can be sustainable. Or not. Okay. Okay. Well, Sherry's got some numbers about. So I'm going to do an overview of the, the different roles that operators are taking in IoT. Sherry will talk some more specifics about Malaysia and about, about the scorecard. First of all, some, some general context when we're looking at IoT. So there are only a small number of operators that are actually reporting their IoT revenues, and when they do, it's a very small percentage. So uh, Vodafone, these are for 20, 2016. Vodafone, just 1.3% of their total revenues. And Vodafone, so the, the biggest, the leading operator probably in, in IoT globally, and only just over 1% of their revenues are coming from, from IoT. So it, we're still at a very, very early stage. Uh, Verizon, another operator that reports its IoT revenues, it was less than a percent last year. It's gone up a little bit since, but it's still very low. Telstra, half a percent. For Malaysian operators, I think it's probably lower than that figure. We're still really early stage. It's still a, a very, very small market. Still, relative. I mean, all of this is obviously relative, and obviously, as you know, the telecoms industry is massive. So it's it's small, but relative to a, a very massive industry. And then, and this this isn't a forecast. This is just a, an essentially a thought experiment. So, if IoT is one percent of revenues in 2016. So sort of roughly between the figure for, for Vodafone and Verizon, if it's one percent, and if it's growing twenty percent year on year, which is the sort of growth rates that Vodafone and Verizon are seeing, but it, that's an aggressive growth rate. It's hard to grow twenty percent year on year. So let's take those two assumptions: twenty percent year on year growth rate, one percent starting point. Well, it'll take until twenty twenty-five 
until IoT is 5% of revenues. So that's 10 years of running really quickly to grow at 20% a year, and it's still relatively small. So we need to be slightly careful about expectations for IoT, even if they grow very aggressively on long time. It's still going to be small relative to the core business. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to go through four different models and approaches that telecom operators are taking. First, connectivity, obviously the, 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 the base role. It's hard to imagine telecom operators playing a part in IoT unless they're also providing the connectivity. That's the entry point for the, for the telecom operators. The second role that we see them taking is this, this generic platform. So not focusing on any particular vertical market, but providing tools, capabilities that are applicable to a number of different vertical markets. The third takes that a step further, and it's where the telco picks a number of vertical markets, selects vertical markets. Um, so it could be smart city or uh, connected car or healthcare. And the operator, again, not trying to provide the full end-to-end -end solution, but trying to find the tools and capabilities that the city or the health provider or the car company can use. Then the final, the final option is where the operator provides end-to-end -end solutions. So an operator branded complete operator service. Just in terms of the, the revenue breakdown, so these are global figures. Sherry will talk about the local figures later. Um, but overall, we see the total value of IoT, including the devices, the connectivity, and the applications. So this is IoT that's enabled by telecoms operators. So where there's essentially devices that have SIMs in them of, of some sort. That we see being about 180 billion around that figure, less than 15% of that is connectivity. So only a small percentage of, of that total spend is on connectivity. Slightly more for devices, 25% 25, 25 for, for devices, but more than half of it is in applications. So of the solutions that telecom operators enable, they're only getting a small share of that value if all they do is connectivity. So you can see from the one hand, there's a clear driver on the operators to move beyond connectivity to provide more of the solution, to provide the devices, to provide the applications. So there's pressure there. Countering that though, if you look at it in terms of margins, the margins that operators would get for their core business are you know, roughly, roughly 10%. It's a fairly stable, fairly stable business, a limited number of competitors. Devices, and where you sit on the device chamber, typically it's a very, very competitive market. Applications can be very successful and can be very profitable, but for every application that you've got that has a 50% margin, you've got 100 applications that fail. Very competitive, very difficult to be successful in. So that's the challenge for operators. They want to get more than connectivity, but if they try to get into these other areas, it moves them away from the core business into other very competitive markets. Now, I just want to take those three blocks, devices, connectivity, applications, Essentially, that's what you need for any service. You've got the hardware, so the devices, you've got the network, connectivity, and you've got the applications, the software. You've got those three elements. So now let's think of what's beneath those elements. So each of those three elements contains plenty more activities. And this, I mean, this is it's, it's quite a complicated chart, but this is simplified massively compared to what the real situation is. Even if you think of the, the core connectivity, the core telecoms business, there are 10 blocks there, I could put 200 blocks there of uh, what's actually involved in being a telco. It, it, that's a difficult business. You think of, of devices as well, you can break that down into plenty of activities. Obviously there's a SIM and there's processors, um, you need to distribute, you need to sell them and so on, lots of activities. And, and even more when you look at applications. So there's the, somebody has to write the code, there's a hosting environment you need, you need to put some security around it, you need to sell that service, you need to support that service. Um, you need to build for that service. So very complex, lots and lots of different elements. So again, telcos, if you want to move into these different areas, there's lots of things to do, lots of complexities to get there, to understand, to get their heads around. So, and it gets even more complicated than that. So that's a simplified value chain, but that value chain is going to differ depending on the vertical market, depending on the application. So if you're talking about um, uh, within the connected car space, if you, you're thinking there, there's embedded connectivity, you buy a brand new Mercedes and it has connectivity, so the operator's selling connectivity to the, 
to the car company selling connectivity to Mercedes, the value chain there looks very different from selling it to an insurer for a pay as you drive insurance proposition. So really you need to understand what the value chain looks like for each of the different vertical markets. So it's a, it's a big task, very complicated, very complicated value chain. But, so let's go through the four different operator roles. Firstly is the, the connectivity, I think well understood. As I said before, it's hard to imagine the telco doing something unless it provides that, that core connectivity. But connectivity, again, is changing from the traditional model. The traditional model providing emigrator speeds for, for a handset, for one of these things, the 2G in relation to 3G, in relation to 4G, and so on. It changes when we're looking at, at, at IoT. The, the battery life becomes more important cost of the device becomes more important, propagation can become more important. So you have things like smart meters or, or, or tracking for, for low value assets and like bicycles, where you want something that's very cheap. You don't need high capacity, you don't need high bandwidth. You're more interested in the cost and the battery life. And then there are some things in the middle, that maybe like a smart watch, quite cost conscious, um, but you don't need full 4G connectivity, you're not going to stream video onto a, a smartwatch or something in between. So we go from a world where the telecoms operator had a clear direction, moving ever higher bandwidths, 2G, 3G, 4G, moving from that, from that road to where you need to have two or three different sorts of networks. And that's something I think we're seeing, we're seeing here in Malaysia, there was an announcement yesterday about a new LoRa network, which you tell from Malaysia, building um, narrowband IoT, other experiments going on, we know here, and other, other similar countries. So operators get this idea that you need to build multiple different networks for, for the for IoT. Um, I mean, the, the extreme of that example of this is SK Telecom. SK Telecom is an investor in Sigfox. It has a national LoRa network. It's been trialing with narrowband IoT, and I think it's going to build an LTE network. So it's, if there's a technology, uh, SK Telecom has been playing with it. So in terms of the value chain, clearly this is all just in the, in the connectivity realm. Um, operators moving beyond just the traditional cellular access also to LPWA, and in doing so, expanding their addressable market. Now, we don't see LPWA, it's not a game changer. It, it incrementally increases the addressable market. So going back to the figure before, we had the total global market for all of this was 180 billion. 10% of that is traditional cellular, maybe an extra 2.5% is the LPWA. So it's a nice amount of money, it's an incremental increase, but it's not a game changer. So typically, most, even if you get billions of these devices, or millions of these devices in the case of Malaysia, that the revenue per connection is going to be very low, maybe a dollar, maybe two dollars a year. So very low connection revenues, um, which means the total value is, is, not, is not massive. But the, the reasons for doing it, telcos want to provide the full range of, of options. They want to block the entrance of new new companies like Sigfox entering the market. There's some incremental revenue, but the costs are also fairly limited. So narrowband IoT, typically just a software upgrade, the same with LTE. And so when you've got a 4G network in place, it's very easy for you to go and provide these extra networks. Um, and the final option is probably the, the main reason, it's probably the most interesting one. I said it before, hard to imagine telcos providing the rest of the solution, selling applications or devices unless they're providing the connectivity. So they need to be finding connectivity at this low end. So I think that's why we're seeing Telecom Malaysia and others interested in, in, in narrowband IoT. That's the first option. The second option then built on that. And telcos, they're, they're already providing connectivity to customers, but the customers are coming to them with problems. They don't know how to build solutions, they need other capabilities. So they're asking the telcos to provide some of those solutions. And that's essentially what we're doing here. Instead of not providing the end-to-end -end solution, but capabilities that build on top of that, that connectivity. Now, some of the big US operators, also in, in, in Korea, SK Telecom, they're doing some of this themselves. They're building application enablement environments themselves. Obviously, you've got hosting environments and some of the analytic tools. They, they've got their own capabilities. Now, elsewhere in the world, the more usual model, so in Europe, most of the operators aren't doing this themselves. They're buying or partnering with other companies. So Thingworks is a name you hear again and again. Another company called Cumulosity uh, have also partnered with a number of telcos. So AT&T, the big, massive revenues, very ambitious, they do it themselves. But other operators, 
uh, partnering smaller operators that typically go down the partnership route. You don't, you don't have to build all of these, these capabilities yourself. You can even buy them from Verizon. Verizon is trying to sell what it's developed in the US, and it's trying to sell that to other operators. So if we go back to our value chain, we've got all of these various blocks. What you're doing by providing these enabling capabilities is, is filling some more of them in pink. You'll be providing hosting, you're providing security, application enablement, maybe device management. So things that are sort of one step away from your traditional core business, but where most operators already have the capabilities, most operators have hosting environments that they're providing to enterprises that can be used for this. So just building on those capabilities, doing it, doing it a little bit more. And in terms of the addressable market, I said the cellular the connectivity is about 12%. Uh, this increases the size of the addressable market by another 10% 10, 10 or so. So you're not going to get, the telcos aren't going to get all of that 10%, but at least they can get some of that 10%. 10%. Um, so quite sizable, similar to the size of the traditional cellular connectivity. It's quite a, a valuable market, we think. And the reasons for doing it, you don't need to be a vertical expert, you don't need to have deep uh, knowledge of healthcare or smart cities or, or industrial applications, you're just providing some of the generic capabilities. The second one, bundling, like I said, telcos are finding that the um, companies are already coming to them asking them for devices or security or hosting and you can bundle those. You're making it easier for these companies to buy IoT solutions by bundling it together. It appeals to a broad potential market. You don't have to be, you don't have to pick the winners or decide which area is going to be most successful. It doesn't look, like I said, if you're AT&T, you build it yourself, but everybody else is buying it from uh, the range of providers who already have these capabilities. So you don't need to do this internally. It works on the, the, the telco model of uh, trying to productize things that you can sell to a wider audience and also the increased revenue that you mentioned. So that's the, the second option, the generic platform. The third option that we see some operators taking is taking that a step further and taking those generic capabilities and focusing on, on specific vertical markets. So healthcare or government, uh, ones where they get a lot of attention. Often there are specific requirements for things like hosting. You need special certification for, say, patient medical records. You can't just use it in a generic <coughs> hosting environment. And that may, may be where the telco already has that certification, you already have the relationships with government uh, and, and so on. So, to give an example of that, Telefonica is doing something like this, Vodafone and others. This is Deutsche Telekom solution. Now, there's the, the light blue box in the middle of the screen. This is the eHealth Connect platform that Deutsche Telekom have. And again, it builds on their capabilities. They're providing cap connectivity, they're providing security, they're billing some analytics tools. And also, the interesting one is around logistics and distribution. They're already distributing um, handsets devices for their, for their core business. As part of their medical service, they're distributing medical devices. So again, building on, on what they can already do, but they're not trying to provide the end-to-end -end service. They're not employing doctors. They're not doing the more complex analytics. That's done in, in this case by the Brandenburg Hospital. The Brandenburg Hospital takes the capabilities provided by Deutsche Telekom, and then the Brandenburg Hospital obviously employs the doctors who are doing the more complex analytics on the, on the, uh, on the results from this uh, patient monitoring patient monitoring service. As I say, the same basic model also works in connected cars, it could work in, um, in smart city, where you provide um, platforms for the smart city without necessarily providing the full end-to-end -end solutions. It's similar in terms of the previous picture, but this is more specifically targeted on, on given vertical markets, so you're, you're, you're painting more of those boxes in, in pink, operating and providing a bit more of the, a bit more of the service. And again, there's a slight incremental value, it depends on the vertical market you, you, you focus on, but the, the biggest ones we think are worth about 6% in terms of incremental increase. Reasons for doing this, you don't need to be a vertical market specialist, so obviously Deutsche Telecom has some understanding of the healthcare, but it's not employing doctors, it's limiting itself. Secondly, it creates an option value for the future, so operators can, if they see, if Deutsche Telecom sees that healthcare is very successful, it can then move and provide a Deutsche Telekom branded service and provide that end-to-end -end solution. The same with uh, smart cities. 
operators could go from providing a platform to providing the full end-to-end -end service, providing smart parking solutions or streetlight solutions or whatever, if they want to, they've got that, that option value. Builds on the third point, builds on existing capabilities and relationships. Telcos typically are already supplying healthcare providers, they're already supplying governments, they're already supplying um, insurance companies with, with services. So they have those relationships in place that they can use and the capability to of this, like we saw on the Deutsche Telecom, they already have a security solution, they already have billing and so on. Fourth point, barriers to entry reduce competition. The further we go along these options, it gets more difficult to do, but it gets more difficult to do for, for anybody. So if a telco is willing to do it, um, there are likely to be fewer, fewer competitors and, as we said, more, uh, more revenue from it. Then the, the final option is providing a full end-to-end -end service. In many ways, this is the easiest to, to understand. This is a telecoms operator um, providing uh, electronic point of sale solution for retailers. Or in the case of Verizon, it's them providing a fleet management solution. It's branded Verizon. Um, they've got a whole range of services. Uh, in this case, they bought the technology, they bought the companies to do it. In other cases, you, you see telecom, telecom operators partnering or white labeling um, third party solutions. I think that's what's, what's, what's happened here in, in Malaysia. In terms of our value chain, I said at the beginning it's a very complicated value chain, and that's part of the problem with this model is you need to, if you're a telecom operator, you need to get involved in all of these aspects of the value chain. Um, and this Again, this value chain looks very different from your traditional business. So you need to start thinking like a fleet management company. You need to understand <coughs> what the requirements of, of, of fleets are, how do you sell that, what organizational structures do you need, what commissions do you need for your salespeople, what channels do you need for market. They're all going to be different from your traditional business. So the more a telecom operator goes into these areas, the more <coughs> the less it looks like your existing business. Now, it may be worth doing that in two or three markets, which are very big opportunities, fleet management being an obvious one, but it probably doesn't make sense for telecom operators to do this in 10 markets or 20 markets. It's just simply too much of a stretch for them. For, for those other markets, it probably makes sense for the telecom operators just to stick to the core services, like we saw in those in the other examples. In terms of the total value, it depends, again, on the, on the vertical market. Fleet management as a single as a single solution or set of solutions, it's, it's very big. So we think globally it's worth about 19 billion. <coughs> important that in some context, that the fleet management, the total fleet management opportunity is about the same size as the IoT connectivity opportunity. So you can see why operators here in Indonesia and elsewhere in the world have been providing fleet management solutions. In terms of why to do that, greater share of revenue as we talked about, increased differentiation built on the capabilities and, and, and relationships. Um, and again, there's the point it's hard to do, but it's hard to do for, for everybody. Because you need to um, join up all those different bits in the value chain, it makes it difficult for, for anybody to do. Um, and in some sense, that, that, can, that can reduce the, the amount of competition. So my final thought really is how those different options go together. Because telcos don't just do one. Sorry, this looks a, it's, it's kind of complicated, very colourful chart because you've got these different options laid down on top of each other. But what we're seeing, from what we expect to see from telecom operators, they don't just do one, they don't just provide connectivity, and they don't just provide end-to-end -end solutions, they provide a mix. We've seen this from operators um, all around the world. So some really good examples, say Vodafone. Vodafone has General Motors as a customer, but all it's doing for General Motors is providing connectivity. So it's just doing option one just basic connectivity. It also has Porsche as a customer, but Porsche is providing a full end-to-end -end solution from hardware, software, and some services. So even in the same vertical market for similar looking customers, telcos are providing a real range of, of different solutions. So just to finish, operators, they need to be well placed in the connectivity market. It's hard to imagine telecom operators getting involved in IoT unless they're doing the, the connectivity. The second point, the market isn't just split between end-to-end -end solutions and connectivity. As we see the market evolving, as we see it maturing and developing, we'll see the value chain break down into components, just as we've done in other technology markets. And for telcos, they need to think, how is that market going to break down into components, and where can they play? And then the third point, which we sort of touched upon, the vertical markets, whether it's for a platform or for an end-to-end -end solution, the ones that will look most attractive are the ones that are nationally bound 
and that are heavily regulated or have some level of regulation and require investment. So I'm thinking of things like um, healthcare is an obvious example, because it's very hard for global companies to compete on Malaysian healthcare, because Malaysian healthcare is different from healthcare in other countries. So you need local providers to do healthcare, and clearly there's a heavy element of regulation <coughs> and local operators they're used to dealing in a, a regulated environment, so, so health, healthcare makes sense. Smart cities can be another one, again, very much a local opportunity. Cities, by the definite, they're, they're, each city is unique, you need a, a local provider to, to, to offer solutions. Um, other markets like car insurance, again, like local markets, different, very hard. Um, for global players to just come in and compete on, on, on those on those solutions. I think those that make it more attractive, things that are less attractive, I think, are uh, markets like smart smart home, where a telecom operator would have to compete against Google and Amazon and other companies that have massive scale, big investments, um, and a much larger footprint than just a single country, single country operator. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Those are the four different options or approaches that we see telecoms operators approaching. Are there any, any questions at this point? Um, is there any business case for a new player, no, a non-telco, to do this, to do this IoT? So there's certainly, um, there's lots of new companies uh, popping up in the market, uh, but clearly, like I said at the very beginning, it's a very early stage. Yeah. So are you thinking of a new player in terms of connectivity or a, a different yeah, I think a non-telco player who wants to come see them. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll see plenty of them. Both, both, and in a way, if you look at the, just go back to, if that's the value to, so my hypothesis is that the value chain for IoT is going to break down. So right now, there are, there's a company called Telensa, and they do smart streetlight solutions. And they basically use everything for the smart streetlight solution. They specify the devices, they, they build a network, they write the software and they also provide the service. So they do they do everything here. But that's that's kind of I think that's the old world. I think increasingly we'll see this breakdown and your the telecoms operator will be provided the connectivity. The devices will just be standard off the shelf devices you get from a Chinese vendor. Um, the, the software will be written by a, another company and then you'll have a local service provider. So it'll break down into at least four components. Components. It's exactly the same as we've seen in the, I mean, the, the market, the telecoms operators itself. If you look back at the, the AT&T in the 1920s, it did everything. It provided, did all the research and development. It, it built the customers. It was, it had factories to make the handset. It was doing everything. And then gradually over time, the, the, the value chain for telecoms broke down into components. It's the same for PCs. It's the same for televisions. It's the same for all of these technology markets. So I think as the market breaks down, then certainly we'll see companies popping up, just focusing on some of these areas. Just you'll get Ma Malaysian service providers who are using software, software written in America, using connectivity from the telcos, using devices built in China, and, and wrapping that up in a, in a service mix. So yeah, I'm sure we'll see new companies emerge. Any more questions, or shall I hand over to Sherry to talk a bit more about the, the local market? Okay, sorry. For Laura is less com complex, so it's easier for those newcomers to, to come up with something. We mm -hmm. question.
this presentation is kind of the one we shared yesterday, but then since you haven't seen before, it's great to have a look at this. It's about the IoT opportunities in Malaysia, about the new roles and body goals.
can also go into a bigger deal to, to provide support. Also, industry uh, consultation and collaboration can help them to build an IoT and uh, uh, ecosystem and capabilities. Uh, good stories is very helpful to educate the market to tell those uh, companies that how it works, what, what's going to be benefiting you, and those kind of those people who are in a similar situation to you, how they change their, their story. So those are very convincing if you talk about those uh, stories to the market. Um, IoT regulation, we need to all work together to improve and to drive this forward. It's not only regulators uh, job, but also others need to help and uh, participate. So one, one uh, summary for operators is to learn globally and innovate globally. Uh, Tom just now has shown already this framework. So this is in similar concept, but showing the other angle with more details. And there'll be some case studies for local uh, operators in this uh, emerging Asia. So the first step is connectivity, and it includes the cellular lines like 2G, 3G, 4G, later 4G, 5G, fixed lines, satellite, and FWA. For this, uh, we have seen this before in Tom's deck, and this is the number uh, from formulation. So for LPWA, uh, it's going to count for 6.4 million LP connections later in Asia by 2025. So that is our forecast. We do have forecast breakdown to different verticals and different uh, applications. And that's a big number. It's uh, quite complex <coughs> to manage those uh, networks at the same time. So it's one challenge that operators are facing now. One thing study for connectivity only kind of approach is uh, Vodafone with Variphone. So Variphone is the one providing post machine you know, in, the, in the retail shops. Uh, consumers have <coughs> to pay for something, and it's one way to, to, to use this machine to charge your credit cards or other costs. Uh, so Variphone requires a very reliable uh, connectivity, and that's what they want. They have other things already in place, including applications, machines, and and those are services. So what does one work with them to offer them the very level of reliability and also beyond that we try to work with very poor to develop very good partnerships to go beyond this connectivity. If we put that into this uh, framework and you can see this uh, dark group highlights the own solution of Vodafone that includes the connectivity and then the partner, partner solutions in pink color uh, so that's the one provided by Variable. But with the, uh, Vodafone also have their own other approaches <coughs> towards this vertical. So it's not only one approach they can adopt, different approaches at the same time. That, that is the big goal. Uh, you have seen this actually in uh, Tom, Tom's uh, slide, but these numbers are all for Malaysia. Um, based on our forecast, it's going to be 0 0.87 billion Malaysia ringgits by 2025 for hardware and installation that includes devices, including hardware and those uh, integration board. So that's accounting for more than 30% of the total growth revenue in IoT. Uh, when it comes to connectivity and services, it's, it's around 16% of the total, and applications take up more than half of the revenue. And as Tom mentioned, is uh, the margin there for connectivity is okay, but then operators are quite familiar with that aspect. The total IoT revenue in Malaysia is going to be more than 2.8 billion Malaysia revenue by 2025. Still a big number. But then how much operators can get for that? That's a question. The next step is uh, to, to work for operators who consider generic capabilities like hacking the existing data centers and buildings and all those uh, uh, services teams, sales channel shops together and they may be able to offer this generic platform to support different kind of vertical applications. One step forward is a vertical specific market platform including different verticals like healthcare, medical cars or smart city. But for that one, it's quite, uh, we need to think carefully where to enter, which operators need to have a very good consideration. Uh, this is one case study about China Unicorn Smart City. 
approach for Shanghai. Um, China Mincom is quite aggressively investing in smart city. They've been working with Shanghai government for a long time. And this picture shows the Disney Resort. So it looks quite familiar, right? It's quite big. And they have quite some uh, parking slots there. So they, they need one solution to help them to coordinate those parkings that demand for the tourists. This table shows the uh, recent big announcements from China Mincom including a uh, tour one for the three years agreement with the government. That's a big amount, but then most of them are spent on infrastructure development, or developing broadband for fixed time mobile or other areas. And in, June, uh, in July 2015, there's a smart parking agreement with Huawei and also Shanghai and Shindy. So Shindy is more like an application developer, and they have this uh, uh, development for Shanghai Disney Resort. That announcement is not only including smart parking, but also including uh, uh, people uh, flow management, smart wristbands. And later, they are trying to do something about 4K video, about uh, virtual reality, also plenty of videos. <coughs> Last year, they announced this five-year agreement with uh, Shanghai government. So that's a big amount again. But this time, they add more things about IoT, is, uh, including 3,000. BLT, BTS, to the video very soon. And we're using that platform, we're going to support different kinds of vertical applications. That's a big plan. Uh, the most recently, they released an uh, end-to-end smart parking solution in Mobile Working by Shanghai. And they already have more than 300 MBLT vehicle sensors there to provide this uh, demo. Yeah, so it's, it's just already doing something. It's already in use and, and it's functional. There's a quote from the Vice President of China Unicom from Shanghai. They are trying to uh, uh, do more about internet plus strategy, a slow down <coughs> of China's and to, to work closely with the industry players, including uh, operators, including uh, different, different players, uh, app developers, device manufacturers, all those players to provide these integrated end-to-end IoT -end solutions for different fields and verticals including uh, smart, smart parking or other things. So this shows uh, several solutions I mentioned just now, like uh, that they, they have this platform of their own, and the vertical platform, the solution with the partners, and they also build different solutions with different partners for smart grids, for smart metering, e-government, smart parking and transportation. There are more to come also. And it can be inspiring for, for Malaysia government and how to work with operators. If we go to the extreme, it's an end-to-end -end solution, and it covers all the, the different boxes in Tom's uh, slide. <coughs> and Telstra is a very interesting example. They invested 180 million US dollars and acquired 15 companies to provide this end-to-end -end, uh, solution. And they, they got all those uh, doctors or nurses and they even got those uh, clinics on their payroll, but it's, it's really a, a big effort to make this work. So it's a typical Aussie thing, right? We go do the big thing and go to all the verticals, and provide everything. There's a quote from them. So they're providing this uh, solution. You can see it's all dark blue, it's all under their, their own brand. The other case study is trying to Tell, tell operators that uh, you don't need to only get one approach for, 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 for this IoT business. It's, it's good to have a mix of approaches in different verticals or even in one vertical with different applications. So for example, like Indosat, they're doing this uh, with their, their telematics and the car solution for IoT. And they, they see this big opportunity in Indonesia. It's a quite a lot of cars they can see from the slide and new cars every year, growing very fast. They also have local manufacturers for cars, and they have motorcycles to this car, you know, like the there. So for, for those uh, vehicles there, how to provide telematic solution to help them to reduce the traffic jam, it's quite, quite serious there, and to help them to save petrol, so all those things they can do. And they come up with this solution, working with both partners from global, uh, from global area, also from local, 
So there are pros and cons about global uh, players, also the local players. For example, like mobile players, they typically come in with a full story, with uh, uh, the complete or more value chain coverage, with a ready solution. But then they are not so, uh, not so uh, willing to customize their solution to local market sometimes. They're also more expensive sometimes. So the local players, they have very good local market knowledge. They know the market well, know the demand, the culture. They're happy to customize for, for, for the client. And also, it's typically more cost efficient. So how to balance these two? Who to partner with is one challenge. For Indosat, <coughs> they are trying to do both. They work with all those who are relevant to the business. It's helpful to get this business rolling. And they are also flexible in terms of approach. They're building this vehicle telematic solution with their own end-to-end -end solution at the same time. And then they're also working with partners. They offer that first, but then based on partnership, they are going to announce something very soon this way, that their own platform, own solution. So you can actually do different things at the same time using different approaches, but still that's a better way to, to get the best out of it. This is the recommendations for uh, based on our overshader now. Um, telcos need to enter this IoT market now. Although it's still early stage, but if you just wait and see later, you may miss the window of opportunity. And that's a bigger risk and bigger cost. And the second recommendation is, uh, as I mentioned just now, for those cases, you, you can be very flexible for your approach. It's not like there's only one right approach. You have to do several things at the same time with different verticals, with the different, uh, even the same vertical are different applications. That's, uh, that's something you can do. And operators need to fill the gaps in terms of capabilities or portfolio to offer this end-to-end uh, -end solution or uh, to offer solution in a bigger, bigger uh, value chain coverage. And uh, they, they must learn globally and you know, in a way of way. So that is about this IoT uh, opportunities in Malaysia. Uh, you, you have seen the forecast numbers <coughs> for revenues, for blue chain breakdown, vertical breakdown, and also some case studies from global players and local emerging Asia players. Yeah, we have, we have talked to different uh, operators like Cellcom, Messis, TMD, and like Cellcom has been doing quite a lot with utility smart metering and uh, also they are looking with the, my, uh, the, the, the small car company like right, uh, helped by the government uh, also they are doing something with smart city but not so much like here for technical Malaysia they are trying to do more about smart parking smart metering smart uh, smart street light smart traffic light and they have been doing some LoRa network working with different operators, sorry, different partners, and with uh, government agencies, like I mentioned just now, the Digital Economy Corporation, also the, uh, the resource agency, you know, uh, they have some announcements. For MISIS, they actually have some interesting uh, development of trials in uh, uh, the ATM, smart ATM machines, and they are doing something with uh, 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 driving, so it's the, they call it M-Drive, it's an application they have, and they are all uh, doing something, trying something. It's quite positive to see them trying. So although still early stage, it's good to see they're not really waiting there for things to happen. They enter into different areas. They have the trials in Laura. They're thinking about the priority and different things are happening to them with the help from them. So it's a, it's a positive sign. The school here. Yeah, so just now was about IoT alternatives in Malaysia. We have done some research recently, published this scorecard for emerging Asia Pacific. So we have been doing this yearly, typically. In the past, we interviewed global operators to have you know, the good, big names there and to compare them how, how they are they're doing. But last year, we did this uh, with uh, 13 operators with emerging Asia Pacific. Because we think it's good to focus on a specific area and market uh, for emerging Asia is so different from other parts of the world and the operators here are so different. If you compare masses with uh, at and it's not really uh, it's not really apple to apple uh, comparison. And also, it's not only about that. We also find some very unique innovations here. 
very close to the market, and you can be very inspiring to the local operators. So that's what we have done and published. So we have this 13 uh, common challenges. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for the some, some <laughs> So for this, uh, this approach, the uh, research, we interviewed 13 of them, and they have uh, three categories, including pioneers. So China Mobile and what often spot going to this pioneer position. And <coughs> they are doing uh, quite well in terms of structural visions and strategy. And also they are, they are trying different kind of uh, technologies. So that's what we think is quite positive. And we have other practice falling to main challenges, including cell compromises. And they are, they are achieving things like I mentioned just now, those activities. And also, they are trying different kind of technologies. For Massix, uh, is working with Waterfall and using their their platform to do the services here to track those uh, bound in, uh, inbound kind of uh, traffic. And they are working with Bridge Alliance too at the same time to do more like as I we mentioned just now, those alliances and partnerships can help you to work on capability or cut coverage. And Cellcom they've been doing quite well with monitoring with a big number and they, are, they have a team supporting this IoT uh, business. They are growing also. We have other uh, operators in emerging uh, com contenders. So it's about this uh, research. So this shows you how we measure them. We put our uh, key KPIs into six criteria including strategy and vision, structure and organization, and ecosystem partnership into the strategy part of this, uh, this evaluation. We also have market status and business scale, and there was status and technology and capabilities and portfolio for the execution part. So those six criteria are what we use our questionnaire and also our interview, our research, to, to find those uh, supporting evidence and to rate them against each other. And we, we come up with this uh, very detailed uh, research and finding. Yeah, so the last slide, we're going to have this uh, webinar very soon. It will be happening on 30, 31st May. So feel free to reach out to that. It's a complete. <coughs> All right, so thank you very much. Any What's questions you have? Do you want to? Feel free to ask. question because I was looking at the news I think you mentioned also there's this yeah. one new company Atelz and yeah, yes, collaborating with e.co yeah. so I was actually wondering because they are providing LoRa network it's more like on the connectivity part um, so is, yeah, that, that was my question trying to relate whether there's a business case for a new company to come in and provide just that because you're talking from the current yeah. area so, so we've seen this in a number of countries. I mean, uh, you you know, I don't know much about it. I read the the, um, the press release. It's 25 base stations, so relatively yeah. small. Um, we've seen this in a number of other countries. So particularly in Europe. So Sigfox is acting mostly as an independent, a new company, either in, as itself Sigfox in France or with partners in some other countries. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they've got significant traction yet but it's still fairly early days. Where we have, there have been some interesting examples of Laura being built out where they have an anchor client. So in, um, in South Africa, it's actually a subsidiary of the telecoms operator, and they built it out because they had the energy company as an, as an anchor client, because they wanted to measure the, um, the, pilot, the electricity cables uh, kind of in really rural areas where they didn't have connectivity from the standards, connectivity from the standard 2G, 3G, whatever. Um, so they built it out there, so they had an anchor client. So you can imagine, I don't know who these guys have got in terms of clients, yeah. but if they had an anchor client in terms of uh, the city authority, which we've seen in some other, some other places, yeah, um, where they have a contract with the city to do parking or whatever. So th that, I I if they have good relationships and, and, and yeah, anchor, as I say, anchor clients to build, then yes, you can imagine them building a, building a business. It, 
like it's 25 base stations, and these are sort of super simple, they cost you about $1,000. Uh, you don't need anything complex in terms of infrastructure. Back all, you just put a 4G SIM in the gateway, and that's it. So it's very, very easy to, and very quick to build out one of these. And if you wanted to, by, by this time next week, you could have 25 base stations doing the same thing. It's <laughs> really quick and easy to do. Um, but then it's the, all of the other complexity is, like we talked about on the slide before, connectivity is only one part of it. You go to enterprises in, in, in Malaysia and you say, I've got connectivity, then they're like, Great. Right, what else do I need to do? And this is what we've seen in other parts of the world, where operators have really had to work with the with the clients to say, okay, we got connectivity, but you also need a device. Here are ten device vendors. You need to host it. Here is we can provide some hosting. Um, you need to develop the application. We know some companies can develop. You have to work. You have to do a lot of work building the ecosystem. So, just putting out twenty five gateways is nowhere near enough. You need to do a lot of work developing the, the ecosystem, which is also what the traditional operators have done a bit in, in Narrowband IoT. So um, Vodafone, exactly a year ago, opened an uh, open lab in, in the UK with Huawei. Deutsche Telekom has done something similar. at and is doing something similar with, with LTE. Um, and I, I presume we'll see something similar from the operators here when they launch Narrowband IoT. Just given the connectivity, that's great, but you need to do lots of other yeah. So I, I don't know how much this company can do and that other stuff, and that's, that's what depends. But yeah, certainly we can see new companies come on and do that sort of thing. Well, quickly, I think also trying to slow the law and the MLT. They are not waiting. Maybe some of the competition So they, they might also play it for their company. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> not only the new companies providing law, like uh, there are big companies like utilities in, in for example, Australia. They are, they are doing something like they just buy the, the connectivities like six from an operator and they get a very good price. And they're going to do their own things like applying this uh, the sensors in the basement to, to monitoring and different things. So they are the one leading this. When it comes to cars, sometimes uh, the, the car company can do the many things. And then they only purchase the community from operators. So different things are happening. Who is going to lead this in which area, how to work with each other, is all like uh, not very clear. We are seeing interesting uh, updates from time to time. Any, any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Hopefully that was useful. We'll make the slides all, all, all available to okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So we end the session. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing.